Essentially, the Brexit debate, if you listen to the media or watch the media, read the media, it picks on isolated situations or it picks on economic forecasts that suggest that it'll be a disaster if we come out. There's debate about immigration, whether we're in or out. And, and there are so many claims and counterclaims that it's quite difficult to actually rationalise or, or, or take a view on you know, whether one should be in or out. Uh, and you also see the sort of people who are favouring Brexit, like Duncan Smith, Gove, Rupert Murdoch, and you think Boris Johnson, and you think to yourself, well, I don't want to be in the same camp as them. Why, why would I want to do that? So I think, I think there are many competing views that are obscuring Mm. what is the main thrust of what Europe is about. And so what I posted yesterday was, was an attempt to try and stand back from the day-to-day -day sound bites and, and sort of machinations and talk about U the European Union as a project. And arguably the European Union started before World War II, but it's definitely the idea of the United States of Europe took hold during the Second World War. Um, arguably it was before that, but let's leave that aside for a minute. The CIA and Bilderberg, which first met in 1954, the CIA in the immediate post-war, were looking towards this United States of Europe. This chap, Kudino Calgary, Kigurli, um, had written this paper in 1925 talking about destroying the nation states of Europe and diluting mm. European culture. So there was definitely a plan to destroy nationhood and culture within Europe. So the question is, is the plan for the destruction of nation states within Europe in favour of a, a super state of Europe, is that plan still intact? Um, now, there is a possibility that they've abandoned the original plan and decided that they can achieve their goal of a one-world government by creating chaos in Europe and fragmentation in Europe and then picking off the nations one by one, and it's a, it's a feasible theory. I suspect, though, that the original plan stays in force because it's much easier to, to create a super-state where you've already got the foundations laid rather than trying to create it one at a time. It's a bit like herding cats if you're going to, to try and cobble together this sort of one world government. The other thing that I think we need to bear in mind is that most of us around this table are of an age where we remember the world, or certainly we remember our childhood experiences in this country of being characterised by a great deal more freedom and a much less bureaucracy and restrictions on what we do uh, than we experience today. Now, the young have no experience of that, but clearly we've been on a progression towards greater control and I would say we're on the low road to enslavement in the police state. It's not very obvious, but you know, that see, if you look at the direction of travel, it's like boiling frogs. People haven't noticed. Mm. Can you give one prime example? Um, going to the airport and being humiliated to the extent of taking off your belt, your shoes, yes. emptying all your pockets. The risk bears no relationship to the humiliation that one suffers when going through an airport. And, you know, if you go back 40, 50 years, you wouldn't have tolerated that. People wouldn't have tolerated that. But mm. by degrees, we've been, we've been led down this path. So to my mind, Brexit is beyond talking about immigration, it's beyond economics, because largely, you know, in or out, I would suggest that nobody really knows whether there would be a net cost or net benefit. I suspect it's going to be more or less 
swings and roundabouts in the round. It's beyond politics because centralised power is a reality and therefore we have to decide what's in our best interests. If we believe that centralised power is the problem and the EU is definitely centralised power, then surely it's best to come out and then address the centralised power within Britain rather than saying, well, we'll stay in the EU because it, it somehow keeps control of our government. Uh, and Eddie might talk about the film that he posted around today or I posted on today, the Brussels business, that actually the European establishment, the Commission, is basically under corporate control. So, to my mind, Brexit is, do we choose a road that's going to lead us to freedom or do we choose a road that's going to lead us to even more centralised power and enslavement? And to me, the only answer is to come out. I find it very confusing, you know, because um, mm. like having two sides of the Conservative Party, both of which I hate, <laughs> and despise and loathe and don't trust and all the rest of it, normally you kind of get things polarised, so you can sort of say, oh, I'm on that side kind of thing. <laughs> and this time it's not like that. And there are lots of elements of it that I can kind of swing either way. So, and I think there's, there's possibly three or more maybe levels. I think there's the individual level, there's the national level, and then there's an international level. So it's like, what do you want for yourself? Well, it's quite handy to be able to travel to other countries without a passport, you know. Um, that's a kind of a, a good thing. And then it's, if you go to other countries, especially we do it often, the health service, you know, that's quite a handy thing to have that, not have to get insurance, especially if you get older or if you get infirmities that are expensive on the insurance, you know. So being able to have some safety net is quite handy. Um, and a sense of community if you go to these other places. And then you get the, the national level, you think, well... How, so how do you mean the sense of community? Well, you're part of, um, just like you're part of Britain. You, you know, you might go up to Scotland, you're still part of Britain. Do you see what I mean? Whereas if you go to another country, each time it's in another... Say so you go to Morocco, which is out of Europe, you distinctly feel it's another jurisdiction, you know, and you haven't, and you go you haven't got much rules. France, well, it's because it's part of the EC. Right. So it's, it's nice to be part of Europe. In that sense, in a security sort of sense, if we go to Morocco, for instance, which is only a step across the water from uh, there, or Turkey, for instance, you feel that your right of law, for instance, is probably weakened. Um, you haven't got so many rights and stuff like that. Whereas if you're in France or Germany or something, you could appeal, you know, if you didn't get any satisfaction on the national level, if you had some problem with police, for instance, you could appeal higher up. So there's that kind of level, and then there's a national thing, which is a bit harder to say, you know, how do you feel your country benefits, you know, so when we joined the EC, there was a lot of people who said we should stay with the common market, because the Commonwealth, because we were doing quite good out of Australia and New Zealand and these other places, they used to buy us with cheap food and materials and stuff like that, so... You say, how does the country benefit? But then there's a bigger thing, you say, international thing. The big thing about the EC was one time was that it would lead to a safer world. You know, that Europe wouldn't be fighting it against, against itself again because it was just one nation. It was, it had a that civil was, war. That's how we sold it on after the war. Yeah, wasn't it? yeah so in that sense it seemed a good thing. And, uh, and when I saw the euro start to grow, I thought that was a good thing, you know, to have one currency. You wouldn't have all these stupid currencies. As you, if you move around Europe and you used to have to keep changing currencies all the time, that was a bit crazy. So it seemed better, and you seemed stronger just to have one currency and be part of it. And the other thing is, when Thatcher was really bad, <laughs> I thought it's great that we have the we're part of Europe because we can appeal to the European courts. You know, if she's outrageous, and, and she was. People were starting to appeal to the European courts to kind of save themselves, almost like you were in Germany and someone's beating you up there, and you appeal to some higher. I think. So I think there's, there's a three levels, or maybe more than three levels, mm. I don't know, on which to judge it. And I can't make up a clear opinion myself. I keep swaying between them all. So somebody said in one of the discussions, I can't remember which on the radio, they said that the European Court is, is actually not to do with the EU. Yeah, the EU, no. EU. It's but a separate I mean, treaty, I think. It's the European Court of Justice. I mean, that if some countries want to dominate, they've done so successfully through economics and through the euro than they have through warfare, that has to be said. But it's a, it's a fallacy that one currency is good because different countries have different kinds of economics. If you're a, a 
an agrarian country, got a different kind of speed of the economy than if you're heavily industrialised and they don't mix very well. And the reason why countries have their own currencies is because around the borders it can adjust to the other countries by having an exchange rate and that's the way it's always worked. And what's gone wrong with trying to push everybody, you know, like Greece, into the same currency as uh, Germany is that they've got different kinds of economies and thank goodness, you know, we're not mm. in there as well. But would the European Union have worked as a political union without everybody having to join the euro and can it be reversed? Um, the, uh, the arguments that I've heard are things like, from both sides, from the Conservatives and, and the Labour, are, um, they don't say this, but it amounts to the W you know is better than the W don't, so stay in. Mm. And there's some chance that we can reform it. But staying in doesn't mean you think it's perfect. No. But it's still very baffling. I've um, been looking at the whole thing like this strange sort of marshmallow of uh, stuff that I didn't know very much about at all. I have to say, I just had this notion of you know, and uh, the notion that you mentioned about oh, there was a, it was set up to give some sort of security, uh, stop wars, whatever. That all sounds very good. And then I remember years years ago being quite confused why someone like Tony Benn, who was a peaceful sort of chap, would say don't go into Europe. And why not? And um, and following it up a little bit, it was to do with the monetary reasons and losing control of your economy. Having this conversation with with Clive today, I, I started skirting around the internet trying to find <laughs> trying to find stuff, and I found the film that apparently you posted what three years ago? It's two thousand fourteen. Thirteen. Thirteen. <coughs> I couldn't really um, I couldn't find a lot of stuff apart from personalities shouting at each other about Europe. Uh, but this was quite fascinating, and it, it basically pointed out about Brussels and the, the EU that um, there's a huge amount of lobbying goes on, and the people that are actually forming economic policy are not really the people that are working there. They're usually from very big corporations around Europe that are actually writing the thing and passing it on <laughs> to the people in Europe, according to this uh, film. Uh, and it went back to the times of Leon Britton and other people. It's a, f a fascinating thing to watch. It, it, it informs you, but certainly informed me, not knowing a huge amount about this, um, that, surprise, surprise, the things that you read about every day now of what's going on with lobbying and corruption, as, as everyone's been saying about Europe, it seems to have been going on. There's another sort of um, link at the moment to do with TTIP, which mm. I, I kind of understand, and it seems to be gaining, gaining traction with Brexit. It's to do with the even more loss of sovereignty and, and more power going to the big multinationals that can actually sue our government if a company wants to force labour rights or ecological rights. If that buggers up someone's uh, finances, a company's finances, they can sue the country, I believe. Yeah. Right. The confusion I have is, how does that differ whether you stay in Europe or come out of Europe? And it seems like uh, uh, Chancellor Merkel is definitely pushing for uh, TTIP to happen, and as a stronger, one of the strongest members of Europe it seems like that will go through, even though no one's read the thing, or certainly none of the public are getting to read the thing. And so if you leave, that leaves us open to big corporations anyway that will probably do whatever yeah. they like. So that's the confusion. It's not going much, much, to make much difference, I don't think. It, it surely must be bigger than that. There must be a choice, and certainly, uh, wh what is it? What is the choice? That, that how, how are people being informed of how to, how to make a decision on this, a huge decision? Well, I suppose um, Obama says stay in Europe because they are busy negotiating TTIP. And it's much more straightforward if it's all done through Europe. And that's why he said, if you want to make an, an agreement with us, you're at the back of the queue. Because we, we wouldn't be 
we wouldn't be involved in that TTIP agreement if we were out of Europe. So we well, would. they're all for the good, wouldn't it? <laughs> well, quite, in a, yes. in a sense. If, if, if that's yeah. what it means, that's, yeah. what, that's the conclusion I draw as to why he's... And, of course, somebody wrote that speech for him because, um, and because he used the word Q. <laughs> no, no the, 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 there is there a... Line. Who would normally have said you're at the back of the line, line. yeah. Yes. So I mean, he's well informed. Yeah. Well, is Q uh, a European language? Mm, well, yeah. It's a British English uh, mm. word, yes. And they use line, don't they? Mm -hmm. Mm. Mm. My, my views or feelings are that um, uh, it wouldn't change much um, no. one way or the other. Interests of this country um, um, are the interests of the city. Um, um, Mary mentioned agrarian uh, <coughs> um, countries and uh, industrial countries. So the fact is that uh, now uh, in the UK we have a service account for 80% of the economy um, with um, informatics, robotization. Uh, as, as of today, um, we might be losing 85% of the existing jobs. So my economy is basic. Um, but I always say that uh, we seem to forget technology and science have uh, set the pace of change throughout history. Globalization means, you know, all the things that we understand by globalization, you know, breaking down the, the social and economic uh, structure of a country. So local production is gone, uh, regional uh, autonomy is non-existent, and now we're talking about whole countries. Uh, whereas in the past, in the mythical past, we had, you know, areas of, well, of poverty and the rich in towns and cities. Now we have whole countries um, struggling uh, under the impact of uh, the financial markets because, you know, the financial markets are ever powerful, the Rothschilds and company. Uh, talking about Great Britain, the Brexit, I don't know, the implication is, should the other countries do the same? But do you think that if, if we get out of Europe, that other countries might get out of Europe? Look, historically, we had, we had this before. Um, great empires broke up. Then, then we had the nationalism. Oh, let's, let's create nations, you know, because it would be, I mean, you know, the 18th century. Um, let's create nations for liberty and democracy. But then look at what happened. It's, it's, it's a seesaw, isn't it? And now we form the EU and it's crumbling down. It will you know, go on for a number of years and decades, but structurally weaknesses will show up. Yeah, I mean, um, on the international scale, you think um, if you look at it like a game of football, you know, if England plays football, perhaps it's a weak team, or plays rugby, it's a weak team. But if it plays as Great Britain, you know, then it's a stronger team because you've got more people to draw on. So if you're a part of the EC and you have to trade, for instance, with other parts of the world, do you think you're going to get better trade deals, you know, with other parts of the world? So that, looking at it in that sense, it seems to say it makes sense to be in a part of a big, a big player. The um, multinationals, um, I've already uh, fined the EU £150 million pound to f pay in fines because the EU um, has rejected growth hormone meat. Um, you know that the case of, of Germany, because it has forsaken uh, the nuclear, there is a big contention there uh, as well. So uh, being part of uh, the, uh, a larger constituency is not protection against uh, the voracious appetites of the multinational. Yes, and then I was going to say that gives you a sense of strength in some ways, but then the downside is these trade agreements yes. which are conducted on a, a sort of um, continental basis. Clearly this TPIP is, is, is a bad thing, you know, yes. and so you get that, and if it's in the EEC, it's harder to, to do some change about it. Whereas if you're just one country, you have a better chance to change or reject something like that. Yeah. But my ultimate feeling is that countries in the past have attempted to grow big, make empires and so on, and succeed like to some extent or not. But I think ultimately everyone has to go small again.
<laughs> because it's only small that's really realistic and sensible, if, and it if, makes sense to if, if, if small if, communities that function, and you can understand the economics of them. If, and if, the if, economics is based on where you are, so you do the best for the land and the environment that you live in, and for the people there. If, if big, it has, it has, has a, a, way a, a bloody history. China, Russia, United States. You know, 50 million poor people. You know, living a, a miserable life of sorts. I don't know, but so, you it's know, we're so talking. Eh? Just the ones that survive. Yeah. I like yes, to refer exactly. to, to Iceland, which has got a very small population. 350,000. Yeah. And uh, they have people, you know, everybody knows everybody else, mm -hmm. well, more or less. Yes, exactly. And uh, if you have people in, 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 in who are running the country who, who you could actually sort of stop in the street and talk to. Yeah, so mm. yeah, Europe, Europe still exists, Europe existed as a continent before the European Union, mm. didn't it? And in theory, we could have an agreement if we wanted people in Europe to be able to run back and forth here and our, our people who settled in, and got villas in Spain and all the rest of it to sort of carry on. Presumably, um, if we got out of the European Union, we could make up whatever rules we, uh, we liked with the individual countries. Once you've got the formula, you can uh, duplicate it, you know. And the, what did you say they are? That they know each other? They are related. They are related to each other. <laughs> <laughs> I know. Uh, yes. Iceland, yeah, Iceland. Yeah. Yes. They, you know, when 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 you go for a date, well, I'm I'm, I'm told <laughs> they they check on the on the mobile whether the person that they're talking to is third, uh, fifth, fourth, or fifth cousin. Uh, <laughs> yes, but that's what, what they do. But it makes it, having the European Union makes it much more convenient uh, to have these uh, arrangements like TTIP because it's all, yes. all in one. Yes. And that's why Obama just wants to keep it all neat and simple. Yeah. And so that's Except that's it's not simple, really. Well, what it means, it, what it means is gift. that you don't have the option. Mm. You know, once you're in, you you know, you get drawn into whatever the majority is. Mm. If you're the only one that disagrees, it's tough. There's know? quite a quite a, I think there's quite a movement in Europe now for anti TTIP, but it's it's mainly yeah, on, the, on the grassroots level. It. We can't guarantee no. it. It's mainly on the grassroots level. Mm. People will tell always tend to no, ignore mm. no grassroots. I mean, the me, the, me, the 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 experience of what happened to um, to Greece. The Greek economy, mm. that's a very serious thing because yeah. that's gone badly, badly wrong. Coming back to what I said at the outset, do we, do we actually subscribe to the view, one, that concentrated power is, is what is running the world, two, that that is a problem, and three, that the EU is a stepping stone to facilitate the world, one world government? Because because to my mind, those are the questions that we need to ask. There are many, if you like, subsidiary arguments related to you know, whether it's in your interest in the short term to be able to travel without too much problem across Europe. Um, I'd say that those are secondary arguments mm -hmm. to the bigger question of you know, what does this mean for the human race? And in my view, centralised power is what's going to cause the collapse of the civilization as we know it and the destruction probably of most of the people on the planet. I'm curious what you would think of that, Yes, because you were saying it wouldn't make much of a difference. Well, no, because um, it's, it's not a democratic, uh, <coughs> a democratic situation. It's, it's not the people who decide how they will benefit from a larger uh, union. I don't know what, uh, how else you could correct it, but uh, at, the bot at the bottom line is that, um, as Marx said, the liberation of the people can only be achieved by the people themselves, not by uh, a stronger government or a larger body of uh, people. It's really up to us. To, to really understand the, uh, the problem. And there's a very, very little, bo a little uh, simple book here called From Dictatorship to Democracy. And the fact is that um, we all live under di dictatorship, uh, whether in, in a nation or in a larger union like Europe. 
and um, the reason why they thrive because we give them power like uh, we spend so so much uh, so much time talking about them um, that is actually giving them power the really challenging truth is that dictatorships have weaknesses but the people never get down to actually locating the weaknesses, let alone start building a strategy to, um, uh, to exploit those weaknesses and, and find out how to use an attack on them as the most efficient way of liberating themselves. Even that book mostly is, is irrelevant except the chapter which says dictatorships have weaknesses. When, whenever we, we describe uh, what uh, the system is doing, we are actually giving it strength and because we, uh, we lose that time from really working at analyzing the situation and uh, locating the weaknesses. And uh, I'm, I'm just thinking why, why I should be at these meetings. And essentially, because it's a good thinking time, and occasionally there might be um, uh, an area where uh, we can be highlighting fundamental issues. Well, thank you for asking me, but uh, that's a uh, that viewpoint, I would say, that comes from, from applying real analysis to given situation and, uh, and mm. working at the analysis until we somehow we are convinced that we have reached the, uh, the big points. I, I, I see that, I appreciate you. <coughs> but I, I still think, for me, there's this rumbling thing that's happening in the world. And through the analysis of uh, critical thinking, these things are very important. So w this seems to be a gaping, a gaping hole in, in uh, issues that need to be addressed and also philosophical things that need to be reached in, in their own time. In the meantime, the world is plodding on, and in, what, two months' time? 23rd of June. <coughs> to, uh, yeah. We're either going to be in or out yeah, of Europe, birthday. and that's going to have consequences. And um, just from, I, from what I see about the general debate, people the general, are going general to make debate the, seems to be emotional from my Yes. Point. Yeah, yeah like, um, well, it's hard to find out the facts. And you see, there, there are not a practical certain fundamental well. issues which are not, and only only uh, only collection of individuals working together to understand the situation can can really uh, make use of the realization that how come anything that uh, any ar arrangement that is uh, reached in secret be allowed to be legal yeah. you mean like the tita like like tita um, what what is what is what where is the the disease which allows decisions made in secret become legal and binding on everybody who who know nothing about if you if you read the details i don't uh, inform myself because i have no time but even <laughs> MPs have a very, very limited power oh. to to have access to the real information. But their own report which, is saying it's bad for England. Um, um, I'm told that uh, they don't have access to the to all the document. Okay, and when when there are these assemblies, each uh, each representative had ten minutes to put their case against uh, anything which they But it's feel. worse than that. To actually read the agreements, you aren't allowed to take a phone, a camera, or whatever. Mm. You, you are given, you are given as an MP, you are given access to the documents under very strict conditions. And watched over. And watched and over. who makes that rule? Who decides that? <laughs> this this is the dictation of the European nice. Commission um, under the direction of the structural elite, effectively. Well, it's Americans who started that because the same thing happened with T TPP in the Pacific. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, and presumably the same thing happened in NAFTA. NAFTA. Yeah. I mean, the only... I mean, Janos asked the question, how do these things happen? 
And the reason that these things happen is because people are distracted with irrelevant or less relevant information the whole time. So, you know, you get the, the Boris Johnson, Rupert Murdoch sort of view of Brexit. You get different... You know, everybody's sort of playing verbal ping-pong around issues that are actually derivative or consequential. Uh, in other words, they're not fundamental to what's at stake here. And as long as we are... You know, I've, I, I've talked in the past about sort of Pavlovian politics that basically, you know, it's, it's the Panama Papers. Somebody threw a stick and everybody chased after it. And it's the same with Brexit. Somebody throws a stick and everybody goes running after it. And it's this lack of will or capacity to stand back and think about what is really at stake here. And that was what I attempted to do in yesterday's post, was to stand back and say, well, you know, what is really at stake? If, if the structural elite are sitting on top of the system that they are attempting to control and create a one-world government, what would they want? And that really, to me, is the only question that needs to be asked, because whatever they want, we don't want. Mm -hmm. that's, mm -hmm. that's, in effect, the answer. So whatever, whatever reinforces the system is bad news for us. And, and I can't see it being any more complicated than that. And Mary's point about, well, your point is that you, you reckon Obama, who, it has been his project, the TTIP sort of thing as, as well, it, it would be easier through a united Europe or everybody cool. close together well, rather, rather than more fragmented. He, he said it clearly, he wants to deal with big uh, uh, assemblies because that makes life easier. And that itself should be challenged. That uh, it's too high a price to pay as far as the uh, people who will be subject to any. And he also said something like he likes uh, the fact that um, us having the city um, is a route into Europe. It's a very That's convenient. It's a, it's a leverage, is what he said. It's, a sh it's like a. It's, it's you give it away, right? I mean. We're like a short. Um, a keyhole into into a bigger area, which is what he's interested in. We're a, we're a, a convenient landing pad. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's the important thing about that film that, that yeah. Eddie referred to, yeah. Yeah. that the City of London is driving the European agenda. Yeah. So don't necessarily see the City of London as part of the UK no. because it's a state within a yeah. state. Mm -hmm. And if you make the mistake of thinking, well, you know, what's, what's good for the city is good for the UK, then that's your first mistake. Mm. Because what's good for the city is definitely not good for the UK. So in, in some respects, pulling out of Europe weakens the city because it will have less influence in Europe. So that's, that's a derivative argument, and I'm not saying that's the main reason, but it's, it's at least one side benefit of coming out. It may not be possible to come out. Um, I, I will qualify that. Um, as Janice said, you know, it's undemocratic. That's the reason why you, you have to... But on the other hand, we have to acknowledge that the church is undemocratic, the, the Vatican, the church, the, the monarchy is undemocratic. Yeah, but we all Structural, come out of all of them. In the structural <laughs> power and in the, in, the, in, the, in the powers. In the, OK, so... So we, we're talking about this thing. So the, we're talking I rest about, my case. Uh, yeah, we not. We, it, it's um, it's um, um, it's not um, uh, either you part of the solution, you you part of the problem. We oppose it. How how do we oppose it? We, we need a different strategy, I would say. But uh, I was thinking when Mary was saying earlier about this uh, about the breakup of Europe, and, and then when you think about it. Uh, have we uh, ever uh, have people of Europe ever been together? Uh, because no. it seems like it's organisations that are actually deal, uh, dealing with everything for, for for the people, supposedly. But it's it's just big organisations that are dealing with stuff. So in a perverted way, one of the best things to bring Europe together would be to leave. And if you could. Uh, start thinking about that as a conversation between the people of Europe to actually show that you have some sort of uh, commonality and, and uh, 
union together. Make an alliance outside of it. I, I, I don't know. Exactly. But, yeah. but it's just uh, when Mario was saying you need to think of a strategy or something else. Because because it's so complicated because because everything seems like it's doing something to bring people together, but actually these top sort of areas are, 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 are all they're doing is fragmenting everyone in the So so actually people by saying I'm leaving that means that you're actually bringing yourself together. You know there are there are two le levels. Um, one one the democratic one, and, and we we know that so we have to to um, um, take that into account. The other one is again the have, have an, uh, acknowledging acknowledging that we we, we, we live in, in either a dictatorship or um, under the cause of fear or you know we're being blackmailed in other words I, uh, take it or leave it either this job or nothing so countries who were at war with each other for 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 centuries and millennia they formed an European. It, 60, 70 years without wars mean nothing, um, because there are there is a war within. There is a they export wars, and there is a war within within the country. The, the total fragmentation, you know, war on on the social structure, and and the family social structure, and the local and the regional, as I said before. Um, so there is a war going on uh, going on at, at, at the moment. At one level. Because everything is media driven, it's, it's an item on our agenda. At one level, we have to, to drop it. We're not dealing with it. We, we need to find, to, to set a different agenda and regroup and reground ourselves. Because, you know, this is a small group, and lo and behold, all the other groups I know of, um, uh, because I'm, I'm a small guy, I only know small groups. <laughs> uh, 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 they're going through the same thing until and unless um, the new strategy or whatever to, to, to regroup ourselves to, to overlap Brexit, it, it Brexit as a topic is not something that we should be preoccupied with no. because there are much our focus is, is telling everyone to go on, jump on board and uh, go along with it and well, and we the best, you know? well to, today's no, is it's over the agenda tomorrow is another one it's yeah. media driven it's, and, a, it's and another we, stick throwing it. And right. It's a stick, and, and we fall to it. Yeah. Well, uh, to be fair, I think. There's numerous. I, I think. You're, the, you are right the, to the, the, the extent. Back, the backdrop to a course of action. I, I think you're right, Mario, that you know, this is not something that is mainstream for critical thinking. Okay. Having said that, I think it's quite useful to explore because it brings out that point in particular, that, that there is a much bigger picture to be absorbed. So the minutiae of Bre Brexit is pretty irrelevant in the overall scheme of things, because it is dog whistle politics, you know, go and look over here, Fido or Rover. But on the other hand, I think it is useful in teasing out these deeper strata, if you like, relating to the whole sort of dynamic of Europe and, and where we're going. Yes. Also, also for critical thinking, I think it's good um, to discuss it as well, mm. for, because I know there's a huge amount of people that are, are very, very confused about mm. it. And, um, we're designed. They will remain, yeah, they yeah, will but, remain confused. Yeah. No, I do. exactly. But I mean, yeah, it's a topic, fine. and if we want to speak to more people, maybe we don't, but I, I think it's it's maybe a way in for some some people it's as well. It's fundamentally about the, about the mind power behind it, isn't it? Fundamentally. Hmm. Historically, the Europe was united under the Romans, and then it was united under a sort of Holy Roman, Roman Empire. Empire. Yeah. In, 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 what, in what way? And then, yeah, <laughs> that's what I mean, it meant control. They did have yeah, control. Yeah. Yeah. Four times. Yeah. Yeah. It was very and loose. the large though. areas. It was very loose. And, and yes. it was sure. loose in the way that you you could do what you wanted, providing you did what well, they wanted yeah. you to do. I know. Yeah. That's, that was how it worked. And then that kind of fragmented a bit into the Hungarian Austrian sort of empire, which wasn't that big, and the Ottomans, yeah. and the British Empire, and the Spanish empires. And the Prussian. 
At the Passion Month, yes. And, 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 the then, and then they've kind of fought each other, which resulted in all those different wars and yeah, yeah. pressures that's gone on. And now it's a kind of amalgamation again. Yeah. Um, so we have had a long experience of being controlled by one mm -hmm. large group or the other at some stage or the other. But we also have a very distorted historical perspective going to back to this idea that Europe has created in Putin peace, uh, the European Union has created peace in Europe. We have this distorted perspective that the Europeans were always fighting each other. Now, under Kaiser Wilhelm, uh, peace was maintained in, in continental Europe for 25 years. And it was only the structural elite and the bankers that fomented World War I. Um, so this idea that, you know, Europe is always fighting and it was, you know, German aggression that created world, was the cause of World War I. Germany had very little to do with starting World War I. It was machinations of the structural elite using the British Empire, the French, and the Russians. Something like to do with Basra and the railway line. Kind of uh, possibly. But they wanted war with Germany because Germany was the threat to Anglo American power. And it was the same with Hitler. So this idea that Europe was the sort of panacea for European wars is absolute nonsense, because basically it was all our fault. We, we started both wars. Well, just on Andy's point, because I, 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 I was watching something recently, and they did mention the, the railway that went yeah, there. Like and a, and a rise to all the they had oil fields rise to the oil fields on both sides of the, uh, the Who railway. Did? That went the Germans, from right. Germany did. When, when? Before Just the before the First World War, that right. they would have actually got into the oil. I think it must have been James Corbett's oil, oil oligarchy Maybe thing. Oh, oh, right. Yeah. Yeah, but, but the Basra Railway that they took down from, from Central Europe mm -hmm. also gave them the rights to, what was it, 200? Miles or something, no, no, either no, side. No, it's only 40 miles on the side. Oh, it was quite a rich. Um, and, and all the oil fields were there, yeah. and suddenly people went. Mm -hmm. and, and within. I think it was about a week of that being signed the First World War started. Mm. Well, it had been in planning a lot before Oh, it had been in planning, but the signing. Uh, it, there was a, definitely a correlation of something. I didn't know that. The Second World War, I, I didn't like, know, I've heard about that. It was almost um, it's in the James designed by the fact of the Weimar Republic. Mm. 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 They almost kind of pre, pre step, step back, it, step you know, back you know, 50 years before that and another 50, the Napoleon Wars yeah. and, 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 and the, yeah, course, the, the colonial course, uh, wars, you know, the, in, in, in another, uh, what, all the Europeans who went to, to, to New Americas, you know, they fought, you know, like all, almost a proxy war. Of, 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 that makes of the case for, for, for keeping these guys in check more, doesn't it? I mean, yeah, I yeah. Mean. but it, 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 it's happening, you know, what, what I say, you know. The, they the, cause all these wars because they want, uh, you know, yeah. to... The, the, the internal war shouldn't be uh, uh, underestimated. No country would go to war without brutalizing its citizens first. Because sure. that war is yeah. unnecessary. Yeah. You know, because the economy depends on it. Yeah. You know. But why does the economy depend on it? Because the banks are going to make a profit, right? No, no, it's not only that. F physical, n natural, and human resources. Yeah, well, I mean, every, we have every, to every country has a certain amount of resources. We, the, 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 the Roman Empire and all empires, the Greeks and all empires, you know, they, they, because the men were dying at the wars, they always had the problem with, with the new generation. So wars were, were, were fought and waged. Uh, to have more slaves, uh, you know, that, that, that was the, the reason. So, in other words, we have to put people as resources for which wars are fought. Well, and also part of the, um, the idea of getting rid of um, surplus population or surplus... Um, well, surplus well, you economy. know, it doesn't work like that only. No. I think wars are quite useful for um, stimulating industry. Oh, yes. Because you've got to... <laughs> um, creative, sure. creative destruction is what you're talking you, about. Mm. You've got to create all those weapons. Well, that's a build-up. And, and then you bomb the right places. It, it, it's, that's right. a build-up. Well, yeah, yeah. That's yeah, a build so it's, it's a stimulus for That's industry. a build-up to wars. They make a lot of money, which, which, which in a war. They make 200 times what they normally make. Okay, but the, it, it, I mean, it's, there are documents, you know, people are, say there, there is no war without trade, no trade without wars. Really? Well, that, that's what people have said in historians. Well, maybe they're wrong. No, well, 
<laughs> look at look at the 16th, 15th, 16th well, century. So, so like somebody, somebody making that up, making that idea up in order to make a point. Just a point. Yeah. Oh yeah. yeah, but what about the 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 the, 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 the you know the, the cause of the, the dynamic of war? The dynamic of war is an encirclement, a country. You know, you, you've got another one gaining a bit of territory south, west, east of where you are. And then the, the one closed in country, sooner or later, um, A, a fears to be, to be overtaken about a more powerful neighbour, or it's got to do something to counteract, to prevent, or, or preempt rather, uh, uh, the wars by not. I mean, you know, uh, study the history of, of Europe. Of you always share, share resources and share information. Well, we, do, we, we don't do that easy, don't we? You know, we do we do the opposite. Yeah, it, 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 take, take, take the case of Germany. Take take it, the case of Italy. Take take it, the case of uh, Spain and Portugal and France itself. All wars are w wars of resources, physical and human resources. Just, just for curiosity, the um, Oxford Union and those sort of places they usually have a debate, and they start off, I think, with this house believes, and you've either got to at the end of it ratify mm. or, or say yes or no whether the, what the house believes is so at the end of it are, are we at a point where we can make that sort of <laughs> statement that, that uh, you know critical thinking believes we should exit or or, or are we still is that, undecided well this comes down to something that janos tabled a long time ago that is the way to arrive at conclusions, debate, adversarial debate, or is it working through all of the problems and getting to some sort of consensus? And I think if you impose a goal or a limit on one's discussions saying we have to arrive at a conclusion mm. we've, we've got to publish we've tomorrow <coughs> this is the definitive statement of critical mm. thinking I think that's the beginning of the end of intelligent discussion because <laughs> basically you're, you're closing down what is inevitably something mm -hmm. that is much something that is difficult to encapsulate within a phrase or a sentence mm. And I think, you know, whilst I have my beliefs as to what I think is fundamental to this decision, mm. I defer to Mario because uh, uh, I think that actually, in the overall scheme of things, it matters much less than the deep fundamental things mm. that we discuss. So, you know, that's, it's rather unsatisfactory to say, you know, critical thinking is not coming out to say you must vote in or out. Um, I mean, if people objected strongly to what I'd written yesterday, then I would try to reflect that in another post. Um, and if, you know, I'm always open to people saying, well, you shouldn't have written that, or, you know, you need to explain this, or whatever. But I don't think we're in the business of laying down policy statements as such. But, you know, I, I thought other people may disagree. I thought...